but he didn't growl. He whined again. Then he went to the door. George switched on her torch, puzzled. Timmy scraped at the door and whined again, but he still didn't growl. Julian, I believe someone is at the door, called George suddenly in a low voice. I believe Timmy can hear a search party or something. Wake up! Everyone awoke suddenly. Timmy's not growling, George said. That means it's not our enemies he hears. He'd growl like anything at the man who locked us in. Be quiet for a moment and listen, said Julian. They heard a little scrabbling noise at the door. Then it stopped. George expected Timmy to break out into a fusillade of barks at once, but he didn't. He stood there with his head on one side and his ears cocked. He gave an excited little whine and suddenly scraped at the door again. Julian got up and went to the door himself, his feet making no sound. Who's there? said Julian suddenly. I can hear you outside. Who is it? There was dead silence for a moment, and then a small, familiar voice answered softly. It's me, Jan. There was an amazed silence in the cave. Jan? Jan at this time of night outside the door of the very cave they were locked in? Were they dreaming? Timmy went mad when he heard Jan speaking to Julian. He flung himself at the door, barking and yelping. Julian put his hand on his collar. Be quiet, idiot. You'll spoil everything. Be quiet. Timmy stopped. Julian spoke to Jan again. Jan, have you got a light? No, no light. It is dark here, said Jan. Can I come to you? Yes, of course. Listen, Jan, do you know how to unlock and unbolt a door? asked Julian, wondering whether the half-wild boy knew even such a simple thing. Yes, said Jan. Are you locked in? Yes, said Julian. But the key may be in the lock. Feel and see. Feel for the bolts, too. Slide them back and turn the key, if there is one. The four in the cave held their breath as they heard Jan's hands wandering over the stout door in the dark, tapping here and there to find the bolts and the lock. Then they heard the bolts being slid smoothly back. He turned the key and flung open the door. Timmy leapt past him and yelped with delight to find Jan standing outside. He fawned on the boy and licked him, and Jan laughed. Let's get out of here quick, said Dick. That man may be along at any moment. Where shall we go now? asked Anne, feeling as if she was in a peculiar kind of dream. Julian stood and considered. It would be madness to go back up the passage and into the old house, he said. If there's any signalling going on, and there's pretty certain to be, we shall be caught again. We'd be sure to make a noise scrambling out of that hole in the fireplace. Well, let's take that other passage we saw, the right-hand one, said George. Look, there it is. She shone her torch on it. They went along the other passage, their torch showing them the way. It was a steep tunnel, and they found it rather difficult going. Anne managed to give Jan a squeeze. You were clever to find us in the dark, and brave, she said. George said nothing. She was thinking, rather unwillingly, that Jan was a remarkably brave young man, and that she'd been silly and unkind to resent Timmy's liking for him. They heard the sound of waves at last, and came out into the open air. It was a windy night, but stars were shining in the sky, and gave quite a fair light after the darkness of the passage. Where are we exactly? said Dick, looking round. Then he saw they were on the same beach as they'd been a few days before, but a good way farther along. Can we get back to the farm from here? said Julian, stopping to consider exactly where they were. Gosh, I think we'd better hurry. The tide's coming in. We'll be cut off if we don't look out. A wave ran up the sand almost to their feet. Julian took a quick look at the cliff behind them. It was very steep. They certainly couldn't climb it in the darkness. Another wave ran up, and Julian's feet felt suddenly wet. This is getting serious, he said. The next big one will sweep us off our feet. I wish the moon was out. These stars give such a faint light. I take you back by the wrecker's way, said Jan, surprisingly. You come with me. 
Of course, you said you knew the wrecker's way, said Julian, remembering. Lead on, Jan. You're a marvel. Jan took the lead. He led them into cove after cove, and then came to a larger one than usual. He took them to the back of the cove and led them a little way up a cliff path. He came to a great rock. He squeezed behind it, and the others followed one by one. Nobody could ever have guessed that there was a way into the cliff behind that rock. Now we are in the wrecker's way, said Jan proudly, and led them on again. But suddenly he stopped, and the others all bumped into one another. Somebody comes, whispered Jan, and pushed them back. Sure enough, they could hear voices in the distance. They turned and hurried back. Jan led them along the cliff face to a tiny cave, really only a big ledge with an overhanging roof. Shh, he said warningly. They sat down and waited. Two men came out from behind the rock, one a big man and one a small one. Nobody could see them clearly, but Julian whispered into Dick's ear, I'm sure that's Mr. Penruthlin. See how enormous he is? Dick nodded. It was no surprise to him to think that the giant farmer should be mixed up in this. The five children held their breath and watched. Jan nudged Dick and pointed out to sea. Boat comes, he whispered. Dick could see and hear nothing. But in a few moments he did hear something, the whir of a fast motorboat. What sharp ears Jan must have. The others heard the noise too through the crashing of the waves on the rocks. Before the boat got to the rocks, the engine stopped. Evidently it was not going to try and come any farther in. The children strained their eyes to watch. The sky was quite clear, but the only light they had was from the stars, and it was difficult to see anything more than moving shadows or outlines along the shore. Then there came the sound of oars in rollocks, and a moving black shadow of a rowing boat and a man could be seen faintly going out over the waves. He must know this coast well to risk rowing out through rocks at high tide in the dead of night, said Dick. Why is he doing it? said Anne. He's getting smuggled goods from the motorboat, said Julian. Goodness knows what. Ah, oh, there, I've lost him in the darkness. So had everyone. They could no longer hear the oars either, for the crashing of the waves on the rocks drowned every other sound. Look! Both men are down in the cove, said Julian. What about us escaping through the wrecker's way while we've got the chance? Good idea, said George, scrambling up. Come on, Timmy, home. They went to the great rock and squeezed behind it into the entrance of the wrecker's way. Then, Jan once more leading, they went up the secret passage, flicking on the torch very thankfully. Where does the wrecker's way come out? asked Anne. In a shed at Tremann and Farm, said Jan to the astonishment of everyone. Goodness, so it's very nice and handy for Mr. Penruthlin, said George. A very good scheme, it seems to me, and impossible for anyone to find out. Except us, said Dick in a pleased voice. We got onto it pretty well. There's not much we don't know about Mr. Penruthlin now. They went on and on. The passage was fairly straight and had probably been the bed of an underground stream at some time. The way was quite smooth to the feet. Oh, we've walked about a mile, I should think, groaned Dick at last. How far now, Jan? Shall we soon be back? We are there now, Jan said. Look above your heads. Julian flashed his torch upwards. An open trap door was just above them. They all climbed out. Julian flashed the torch round the shed. Well, who'd have thought that the sacks he'd seen in here the other day were hiding the trap door that led to the wrecker's way? I tell you what we'll do, said Julian. We'll shut the trap door and pile sacks and boxes and everything on top of it. Then when the men come up, they'll find themselves trapped. Then they won't be able to get out. If we can get the police in time, they'll be able to catch them easily. Good idea, said Dick. They can't get out the other way because the tide's up. They shut the big trap door and then began to drag sacks, boxes and even some kind of heavy farm machine on top of the trap door. Now certainly nobody could open it from underneath. 
They were hot and very dirty by the time they'd finished. They were also beginning to feel very tired. Whew, said Dick. I'm glad that's done. Now we'd better go to the farmhouse and show ourselves to Mrs Penruthlin. Oh, dear. Do we tell her about her husband and how he's mixed up in this horrid business? said Anne. I do so like her. I expect she's very worried about us, too. Yes, it's going to be a bit difficult, said Julian soberly. The five children and Timmy left the machine shed and made their way towards the farmhouse. Suddenly, from the darkness, a sharp whisper made them stop. George put her hand on Timmy's collar to stop him growling or barking. Who is this now? None of the little company answered or moved. The whisper came again. Here, over here. And then, as if too impatient to wait any longer, the whisper moved out into the yard. Julian couldn't see who it was in the dark, and he quickly flashed his torch on the man. It was the governor, grim-faced as ever. He flinched as the light fell on his face, took a few steps back, and disappeared round a corner. Timmy growled. Well, how many more people wander about at night here, said Dick. I give it up, said Julian. I'm getting too tired to think straight. I shouldn't be in the least surprised to see Clopper the horse peering round a corner at us and saying, Peepo, chaps. Everyone chuckled. It was just the kind of thing Clopper would do if he really were alive. They came to the farmhouse. It was full of light, upstairs and downstairs. The curtains were not drawn across the kitchen window, and the children looked in as they passed. Mrs Penruthlin was sitting there, her hands clasped, looking extremely worried. They opened the kitchen door and trooped in. Mrs Penruthlin leapt up at once and ran to them. She hugged Anne. She tried to hug George. She said all kinds of things at top speed, and to the children's dismay, they saw that she was crying. Oh, where have you been? she said, tears pouring down her face. The men are out looking for you, and all the dogs and the barnies too. Oh, they've been looking for ages. And Mr. Penruthland's not home either. I don't know where he is. Oh, what a terrible evening. Oh, but thank goodness you're safe. Julian saw that she was terribly upset. He took her arm gently and led her to a chair. Don't worry, he said. We're all safe. We're sorry you've been upset. I pictured you drowned or, or lost on the hills or fallen into quarries. And where is Mr. Penruthland? He went out at seven and there's not been a sign of him since. The children felt uncomfortable. They thought they knew where Mr. Penruthland was, getting smuggled goods from the motorboat and carrying them back with his friend up the wrecker's way. Well, said Julian, it's a long story, but I'll try to make it short. Strange things have been happening, Mrs. Penruthlin. He plunged into the whole story, the old tower, Grandad's tale of the flashing light, their journey to explore the tower, the secret passage to the wrecker's cove, their imprisonment and escape. And then he stopped. How was he to tell poor Mrs. Penruthlin that one of the smugglers was her husband? He glanced at the others desperately. Anne began to cry, and George felt very much like it, too. It was Jan who suddenly spoke and broke the news. We seen Mr. Penruthlin in the cove, he said. We seen him. Mrs. Penruthlin stared at Jan, and then at the embarrassed, anxious faces of the other children. You saw him in the cove, she said. What was he doing there? We... we think... We think he must be one of the smugglers, said Julian awkwardly. We think we saw him get into a boat and row to the motorboat beyond the rocks. If so, he... Well, he may get into trouble, Mrs Penruthlin, and... He didn't finish, because to his enormous surprise, Mrs Penruthlin jumped up from her chair and boxed his ears soundly. He hadn't even time to dodge. Oh, you wicked boy, panted Mrs Penruthland, sounding suddenly out of breath. Oh, you, you bad, wicked boy, saying things like that about Mr Penruthland, who's the straightest, honestest, most God-fearing man who ever lived. 
Him a smuggler. I'll box your ears till you eat your words and serve you right. Julian dodged the second time, amazed at the change in the cheerful little farmer's wife. Her face was red, her eyes were blazing, and somehow she seemed to be taller. He had never seen anyone so angry in his life. Jan went promptly under the table. Now, you apologise, she said, or I'll give you such a drubbing as you've never had in your life before. Oh, and you just wait and see what Mr. Penruthland will say when he comes back and hears the things you've said about him. Julian was much too big and strong for the farmer's wife to give him a drubbing, but he felt certain she would try if he didn't apologise. What a tiger she was! He put his hand on her arm. Don't get so upset, he said. I'm very sorry to have made you so angry. Mrs. Penruthland shook his hand off her arm. Angry? I should just think I am angry, she said. To think anyone should say those things about Mr. Penruthland. That wasn't him down in Wrecker's Cove. I know it wasn't. I only wish I knew where he was. I'm that worried. He'd be down Wrecker's way, announced Jan from his safe vantage point under the table. We put trap door over he. Down Wrecker's way, cried Mrs. Penruthland, and to the children's great relief she sank down into a chair again. She turned to Julian questioningly. He nodded. Yes, we came up that way from the beach. Jan knew it. It comes up in a corner of the machine shed, through a trap door. We, um, we shut the trap door and piled sacks and things on it. I'm afraid, well, I'm rather afraid Mr. Penruthland can't get out. Mrs. Penruthland opened and shut her mouth several times, rather like a goldfish gasping for breath. All the children felt most uncomfortable and extremely sorry for her. Oh, I don't believe it, she said at last. It's a bad dream. It's not real. Mr. Penruthland will come walking in here at any moment, I tell you. He's not down in the wrecker's way. He's not a bad man. There was silence after this. And in the silence, a sound could be heard. The sound of big boots walking over the farmyard. The footsteps came round the kitchen wall and up to the kitchen door. I know who that is, said Mrs. Penruthland, jumping up. The door opened and in walked Mr. Penruthland. His wife ran to him and flung her arms round him. Oh, Mr. Penruthland, the tales these bad children have told about you, cried his wife. They said you were a smuggler. They said they'd seen you in Wrecker's Cove going out to a motorboat to get smuggled goods, and you were trapped in Wrecker's Way, and they'd put the trap door down, and... Mr. Penruthland pushed his wife away from him and swung round on the astounded children. They were most alarmed. How had he escaped from Wrecker's Way? Surely even his great strength could not lift up all the things they'd piled on top of the trap door. What's all this? he demanded, and they gaped at his speech. They were so used to his peculiar noises that it seemed amazing he could speak properly after all. Well, sir, began Julian awkwardly, we, uh, we really thought we recognised you in Wrecker's Cove, and we thought we'd trapped you and your friend by shutting the trap door at... You've got things wrong, said Mr. Penruthland, and his voice sounded urgent. I'm working with the police. It was someone else down in the cove, not me. I've been on the coast, it's true, watching out and getting drenched, as you can see, all to no purpose. Now, what do you know? What's this about the trap door? Did you really close it and trap those men? All this was so completely astonishing that for a moment nobody could say a word. Then Julian leapt up. Yes, sir. We did put the trap door down, and if you want to catch those fellows, send for the police and we'll do it. We've only got to wait beside the trap door till the smugglers come. Right, said Mr. Penruthland. Come along. Hurry. In the greatest surprise and excitement, the five children rushed to the kitchen door to follow Mr. Penruthland. They hurried over the farmyard with Jan a little way behind, and Timmy leaping round like a mad thing. They came to the machine shed and went in. We piled, began Julian, and then suddenly stopped. Mr. Penruthland's powerful torch was shining on the corner where the trap door was fixed. It was open. 
the sacks and boxes that the children had dragged over it were now scattered to one side. Who opened it? said Julian, amazed. Sir, the smugglers have got out with their smuggled goods and they've gone. We're beaten. Mr. Penruthlin made a very angry noise and flung the trap door shut with a resounding bang. He silently led the way back to the farmhouse with the children trailing behind. Five past three in the morning, he said, looking at the clock. I'll sleep down here for an hour or two, or, and I'll be up to milk the cows. Send these children to bed. I'm too weary to talk tonight. And with that, he put his hand to his mouth and quite solemnly took out his false teeth, putting them into a glass of water on the mantelpiece. Mrs. Penruthlin hustled Julian and the rest upstairs. They were almost dropping with exhaustion now. The girls managed to undress, but the two boys flopped on their beds and were asleep in half a second. They didn't stir when the cocks crowed, or when the cows lowed, or even when the wagons of the Barneys came trundling out into the yard to be packed with their things. They were going off to play in another village that night. Julian awoke at last. It took him a few moments to realise why he was still fully dressed. He lay and thought for a while, and a feeling of dejection came over him when he remembered how all the excitement of the day before had ended in complete failure. If only they knew who had opened that trap door. Who could it be? And then something clicked in his mind, and he knew. Of course! Why hadn't he thought of it before? Why hadn't he remembered to tell Mr. Penruthlin about the governor standing in the shadows and his whispered message? He must have been waiting for the smugglers to come to him, of course. The Barneys often came to play at Tremannan Barn. Nothing could be easier than for the governor to arrange for the smuggling to take place then, for the wrecker's way actually had an entrance in the shed near the big barn. If a stormy night came, all the better. No one would be about. He could go up on the hills and wait for the signal from the tower which would tell him that the boat was coming. Everything fell into place. All the odd bits and pieces of happenings fitted together like a jigsaw puzzle. Julian heard the noise outside and got up to see what it was. When he saw the Barneys piling their furniture on the wagons, he rushed downstairs, yelling to wake Dick as he went. He must tell Mr. Penruthlin about the governor. He'd probably got the smuggled goods somewhere in one of the boxes on the wagons. What an easy way of getting it away unseen. The governor was cunning, there was no doubt about that. With Dick at his heels, puzzled and surprised, Julian went to find Mr. Penruthlin. There he was, watching the Barneys getting ready to go, looking very dour and grim. Julian ran up to him. Sir, I've remembered something, something important. Can I speak to you? Julian poured out all he had surmised about the governor. And it must have been he who opened the trap door, sir. Why didn't you tell me this last night? said Mr. Penruthlin. We may be too late now. I'll have to get the police here to search these wagons. But if I try to stop the Barneys going now, the governor will suspect something and go off at once. Julian was relieved to see that Mr. Penruthlin had his teeth in again and could speak properly. The farmer pulled at his black beard and frowned. I've searched many times through the Barney's properties to find the smuggled goods, he said. Each time they've been here, I've gone through everything in the dead of night, but always without success. Do you know what it is they're smuggling? asked Julian. The farmer nodded. Yes, dangerous drugs. Drugs that are sold at enormously high prices in the black market. The parcel wouldn't need to be very big. If it's a small parcel, it could be hidden easily said Dick thoughtfully. Mr. Binks came up at that moment, carrying Clopper's front and back legs. He grinned at the boys. You led us a fine dance last night, he said. What happened? Yes, said Sid, coming up with Clopper's ridiculous head under his arm as usual. Clopper was right worried about you. Gosh, you didn't carry old Clopper's head all over the hills last night, did you? said Dick, astonished. No, I left it with the governor said Sid. He took charge of his precious clopper while I went gallivanting over the hills and far away, looking for a pack of tiresome kids. Dick stared at the horse's head, with its comical rolling eyes. He stared at it very hard indeed. 
And then he did a most peculiar thing. He snatched the head away from the surprised Sid. Sid gave an angry yell. No, then, what do you think you're doing? The governor came across the yard at top speed, looking furious. He shouted, he yelled, he shook his fist. Then Julian suddenly saw light. He knew why Dick had snatched Clopper's head. Mr. Penruthlin, why does the governor always have someone in charge of Clopper's head? He said. Maybe he hides something precious there, something he doesn't want anyone to find. Yes, said Dick. Take it. I bet it's got the goods in it. The governor tried to snatch Clopper away from the big farmer, but he was a small man and Mr. Penruthlin was well over six feet. He calmly held the horse's head out of reach with his strong right hand and fended off the governor with the other. The Barneys surrounded the little group in excitement and one or two farm men came up too. Mrs. Penruthlin and the girls, who were now up, heard the excitement and came running out as well. Hens scattered away, clucking, and the four dogs and Timmy barked madly. The governor was beside himself with fury. He began to hit the farmer, but was immediately pulled away by one of the farm men. You leave that horse alone, he shouted. It's my property. What do you think you're doing? You say this horse is your property, said the farmer. Is it entirely your property, inside as well as outside? The governor said nothing. He looked very worried indeed. Mr. Penruthlin turned the head upside down and looked into the neck. He put his hand in and scrabbled about. He found the little lid and opened it. Out fell about a dozen cigarettes. They're mine, said Mr. Binks. I keep them there. Anything wrong with that, sir? It's a little place the governor had made for me. Nothing wrong with that, Mr. Binks, said the farmer, and put his hand in again. He pulled at the lid and ran his finger round the hole where Mr. Binks kept his cigarettes. The governor watched, breathing quickly. I can feel a false bottom to this clever little space. How do I get it open, governor? Will you tell me, or do I smash Clopper up to find it? Ah, I found the trick, said Mr. Penruthlin suddenly. Now I've got it. He worked his fingers about in the space that he'd suddenly hit on. He pulled out a package done up in white paper. A small package, but worth many hundreds of pounds. What's this, Governor? He asked the white-faced man. Is it one of the many packets of drugs you've handled round this coast? Was it because of this secret of yours that you told Sid never to let Clopper out of his sight? Shall I open this packet, Governor, and see what's inside? A murmur arose from the Barneys, a murmur of horror. Sid turned fiercely on the governor. You made me guard your horrible drugs, not Clopper. To think I've been helping you all this time, helping a man who's only fit for prison. Mr. Penruthlin put the white package into his pocket. Lock the governor up in the small barn, he ordered. And you, Dan, get on your bike and get the police. As for you, Barneys, I... Don't rightly know what to say. You've lost your governor, but it's good riddance, I'll tell you that. He used us as a screen for his goings-on, said one of the Barneys. It's good riddance, all right. We'll manage, said another Barney. We'll get along. Hey, Sid, cheer up. We're not going to use Clopper any more, said Sid. He'll bring us bad luck. We'll get a donkey instead and work up another act. I couldn't wear Clopper again. Right, said the farmer, picking up Clopper's head. Get the back and front legs. I'll take charge of old Clopper. I've always been fond of him, and he won't bring any bad luck to me. There was nothing more to be done. The Barneys said rather a forlorn goodbye. Sid and Mr Binks shook hands solemnly with each of the children. Sid gave Clopper one last pat and turned away. See you again when next you're by here, said Mr Penruthlin. You can have my barn any time, said. The governor was safely locked up, waiting for the police. Mr. Penruthlin picked Clopper up, legs and all, and looked down at the five children, for Jan was now with them. He smiled at them all, looking suddenly quite a different man. Well, that's all finished up, he said. Dick, I thought you'd gone mad when you went off with old Clopper's head. It was certainly a bit of a brainwave said Dick modestly. It came over me all of a sudden. Only just in time, too. 
The Barneys were nearly on their way again. They went over to the farmhouse. Mrs. Penruthlin had already run across. The girls guessed why, and they were right. I'm getting a meal for you, she cried as they came in. Poor children, not a mite to eat have you had today. No breakfast, nothing. They all sat down. Julian solemnly put a chair beside him and arranged Clopper in such a way that it looked as if he were sitting down too. Anne giggled. <laughs> oh, Clopper, you look quite real. Mr. Penruthlin, what are you going to do with him? I'm going to give him away, said the farmer, munching as hard with his teeth as he did without them. To a um, friend of mine. Lucky friends, said Dick, helping himself to a hard-boiled egg and salad. Do they know how to work the back and front legs, sir? Oh, yes, said the farmer. They know fine. They'll do well with Clopper. <laughs> There's only one thing they don't know. <laughs> the children looked at him in surprise. Why the sudden guffaw? What's that? asked George. Well, <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> they don't know how to undo the zip, <laughs> said the farmer, and roared again till the tears came into his eyes. Mr. Penruthlin, now behave yourself, said his amused wife. Why don't you say straight out that you're giving Clopper to Julian and Dick instead of spluttering away like that? Gosh, are you really, said Dick, thrilled. Thanks most awfully. Well, you got me what I wanted, so it's only right and fair I should give you what you wanted, said the farmer, taking another plate of ham. You'll do well with Clopper, you and your brother. You can give us a show one day before you leave for home. Oh, <laughs> Clopper's a queer one. See him looking at us now. He winked, said George in an astonished voice, and Timmy came out from under the table to stare at Clopper with the others. I saw him wink. Well, it wouldn't be surprising if he had winked. He really had had a most exciting time.